Hi, I'm Leanne Abraham. I'm a data visualization engineer at Planet. Um, and in my role, one of the things I get asked to make all the time is if I can add animation to a visualization that I've made. Um, this can mean everything from animating small multiples to promote a new piece of collateral on Twitter to creating an engaging video to play on an LED wall during a conference. The connecting piece here is that since the thing I'm animating is data, I can't fake it. And I needed to teach myself how to incorporate animation into my existing data viz workflows. So in this talk, I'm gonna go over some of the basics of what I've learned for adding movement and animation to your maps. And just FYI, I'm gonna keep this pretty high level. So if you're looking for the particulars of 3D rendering and how to visualize millions of points interactively, this isn't going to be that. But if you're familiar with creating maps in Photoshop and Illustrator, um, hopefully this will help connect some of the dots in that workflow in a way that folks will find useful. Um, so before you begin, you should ask yourself, are you sure you want to animate this map? Um, there's no way around it. Animation is a really time intensive process and without a justification for going down the rabbit hole, um, maybe don't bother. <laughs> and okay, so you've decided you definitely want to do it. The next question you should ask is why are you doing it and what do you want the viewer to get out of watching your animation? Um, some of the places I've seen animations excel is visualizing transitions and state changes, um, giving away for the transit, eh, transitioning the viewer from one point to another in the story. Um, it can give you the ability to add or remove data without coding. Um, you can visualize time and illustrate progression in a really easily digestible way. And you can add an additional format to your offerings. Um, so you can visualize the same data in different mediums, for different mediums. Um, at work, I'm really often asked, hey, can you make a GIF of that for something that would be perfectly suitable as a static graphic? But if your intention is to grab as much attention as possible, because maybe you're a salesperson and you're not always looking for refined and requires studying, you don't want the person to sit with it. You want easy to understand, quick to quick to get moving on. Um, animation can also mimic the interactivity of other mediums. So if you don't want to show people an interactive web map or perhaps you can't, um, creating an animation can be a really good alternative. And finally, it's pretty fun. Um, I find that people like to watch an animation more than they like to study a complex data visualization. Um, so you've decided you want to animate your map. How are you going to do it? Um, something to remember is animations have frames. So we're no longer creating a single image, but many with slight changes in between. So we need to start thinking in volume. How will each piece of data change or what data needs to be included in each scene? So to focus on the quick and dirty part, if you're trying to get something serviceable out the door quickly, I find that GUIs, and especially in my case, Adobe products are the fastest way for me to do that. Um, but I wanna respect that everyone has different workflows, needs, and budgets. Um, so some of this might translate into other programs, some might not, but just FYI, I'm gonna focus on Adobe products. <laughs> um, but before I get into all that, I do wanna make it clear that I don't want to give the impression that this is my entire workflow. In JavaScript, for example, you can export scenes of an animation that you built on the web. Um, Image Magic allows you to create GIFs and videos in, from stacks of imagery without even opening up a program. I'll also use Bash to script GDAL to batch process geotiffs. Um, I know ArcGIS and, and QGIS both allow you to visualize time series data and export videos. Um, and I'll also use Python and Pandas to edit spatial data to get it ready for an animation before ever opening it up in a in like an Adobe product. Um, so that said, these are all different ways to maybe analyze or animate a stack of images. But what if you want to do editing other than compositing these animations? Um, something as seemingly simple simple as adding a stylized toolbar or animating a scale bar. Um, you might hit a wall. Maybe you want to be able to dynamically add or remove labels. All of this is possible in After Effects, so that's where I'm going to focus the majority of my talk. Um, so getting started. Before getting into After Effects, I do want to say Photoshop is probably the easiest method for creating really quick animations or GIFs. Um, this is also the part where I recommend always exporting video if you're animating imagery, especially satellite imagery. Um, GIFs add a lot of compression artifacts, they have a limited number of possible colors, and they're really large files relative to video. Um, I'm also not positive about this, but I'm fairly certain many platforms such as Twitter will just convert GIFs to video anyway, so you're better off just uploading the video in the first place. Um, where Photoshop really excels is if you're creating a comparison between a small number, let's say like less than five or so frames, and you have a limited number of label changes. 
it can get unwieldy really fast. If you're trying to add lots of labels, you want to add or remove labels at different times, you're adding a lot of motion. Um, so what I've done here is I've provided an example of how you'd create an animation that fades between two images. Um, basically, I've created a little fade at the end of both images so that when you play it, it appears in a continuous loop. Um, and finally, to export that um, from Photoshop, you can either save for web using their legacy option, um, which allows you to export a GIF and you can set color depth, et cetera, or you can render video. Um, and this is kind of what it would look like all put together. Um, hopefully the video played. <laughs> um, what you would see is a comparison between a true color image of the eruption on La Palma in the Canary Islands on September 25th and a false color composite of the same eruption on the 26th. And you can see kind of like a glowing lava. Um, okay, so <laughs> let's say you're like, I want to animate way more images than just one or two then you probably want to start looking into Photoshop or um, After Effects. <laughs> um, this is the first kind of raster animation that I used After Effects for. Um, this allows you to animate a stack of images as if they were frames in a movie. This is super useful if you have a stack of geotiffs at a regular interval, think like weather data that you want to animate through. In my case, I'm often animating satellite imagery time lapses over long periods, um, and this is the best way I found to do it. It also improves on the Photoshop method because it makes short work of importing hundreds of images at the same time. Um, and often it gets around the problem of needing to color correct each image separately. Um, so you can batch apply a curve. Um, in order to import a stack of imagery as a sequence, you only have to select the first file in the sequence. Um, but just a reminder, those files need to be cropped to the same area. They need to be in the same folder and they need to use the same numeric or alpha alphabetic pattern name. So After Effects is not going to recognize non-numeric dates, for example. So if you have like March 1st, March 2nd, it might do okay. But once you get into April 1st, it's not going to know that March came before April. Um, so again, some pros can be, you can apply things like Photoshop curves across the entire stack of imagery. And then you can tween between the curves using keyframes. Um, this can be super useful if you're dealing with seasonal data. It also has the benefits of being able to remap time. You could stabilize the imagery. You can add vector on vector data on top without baking it in. You can change the frame rate, et cetera, all of which would, wouldn't be possible with something like image magic. Well, you could change the frame rate, but like not within the image stack itself. Um, so at this point, you're probably starting to wonder, well, what about animating vector data? Um, to animate vector data, uh, the first thing I do is I make sure that my Illustrator file is prepared to import into After Effects. I design all my maps in Illustrator, so once I'm pretty set on the style, I'll import to add in animations. Um, importing with retained layer sizes is really important because it maintains the relationship between different layers. Um, this is what keeps it a map. Um, your final composition can be a different size than your Illustrator artboard, but depending on what you're trying to do, I try to make sure that my Illustrator artboard's a bit bigger to give me wiggle room. Um, these layers are linked, so if you change styles in Illustrator, it'll update in, um, in <laughs> After Effects. Um, and once you click on a layer to create shapes, this is the point where it becomes unlinked, but it's also necessary in order to use the full suite of After Effects styling on individual pieces of a layer. So for example, if you wanted to animate individual lines in a road network, um, I find it easier to make complex shapes, colors, et cetera, in Illustrator, but anything that needs to be animated, again, you would do it in After Effects. Um, so great, you've got your data imported. Now it's time to animate it. Um, I'm gonna go over a few techniques to make simple animations that I use all the time, and hopefully that's enough to get people started. Um, so, just FYI, before getting started, I like to parent anything, any layers I'm animating to the base map so that if you move the base map, all the layers move together. Um, and the very first thing I tried to do in After Effects was animate a line. It turned out this was super simple using trim paths. Um, so you add trim paths to a path, you select the, you can do this by hitting add in the upper right, and it's about halfway down the menu. And so once you've added this to a path, you basically create a keyframe at the start you create a keyframe at the time that you would like to end. You set the first one to zero, the second one to 100, 
And just like that, you have a line that advances through time. Um, you can also add easing between the keyframes, like I've shown in the second sample GIF. I think this can give it like more of a natural feel depending on what you need. Um, and basically this like start end keyframe workflow is how you would animate all different kinds of data. So it's a really similar idea if you want to like change opacity in a layer, you want to move something around all of this sort of start end keyframe method is how you would do that. Um, the next step, which I don't have time to get into here, would be creating a null from the path, which you could then tie a shape to. Um, this would give you the ability to do something like attach an arrow to the end of the line, or maybe a little car, or you could get rid of the line entirely and just have that item follow the path of the line. Um, right, so what about labels? Um, adding text is actually one of the really tricky parts in After Effects. You can copy and paste between Illustrator and After Effects, but in order to animate individual layers, you either have to copy and paste them individually, or you just have to make the label in After Effects itself. Um, you can import an entire label layer, which I've done here, um, but you won't be able to animate the individual pieces of text. Um, so, for example, what I've included is one set of labels in the base map layer, and I've added another manually. So one static, but one I'm able to animate, like the San Francisco. Um, and in order to create that effect, I've done, it required a combination of easing in the opacity as well as changing the vertical position of the label. Um, okay, so you've animated a 2D map. How about making it 3D? Um, this is where it starts to get really neat, in my opinion. So once you have your map view set in a 2D composition, it's fairly seamless to create like a 3D flying map view just by manipulating a camera link to a null. So you can add a camera in a null just by right-clicking under your layers, parent them both to the null, and then adjust the position and add keyframes to control the camera. Um, what does this look like? Um, here I've created a little animation of what it'd be like if I basically drove from San Francisco to Oklahoma City. Uh, which I obviously, obviously haven't done because this talk is pre-recorded. <laughs> um, and finally, in order to make something a globe, um, this is surprisingly simple. Um, your base map just needs to be projected into WGS84. And then because CC sphere just needs a two to one ratio, which this map projection is already in, um, you'll find that you can seamlessly project <laughs> basically any global data set onto a globe. After Effects. Um, once you apply CC Sphere, this is just in the effects selection. Um, you can further adjust light, shading, add keyframes for rotation, etc. So, for example, if you wanted to do one complete rotation, you would add a keyframe where it basically says 0x, and then you would add another keyframe a bit further along, and you change that first 0 to a 1. And that's one complete rotation. Um, where this starts to get really cool is it also works for videos. So you could really easily create a TIFF sequence of global data and wrap it around the sphere. Um, yeah, so that's it. I hope I inspired folks to go out and create their own map animations. Um, I've barely scratched the surface of what these programs can do. Um, but yeah, basically like advanced topics would be something like working with expressions or doing any kind of data driven styling. Um, in dealing with time. So if anyone has questions about that, feel free to reach out and yeah, hope you have a good rest of your conference.